uh, Filmation came from, we had to have a name. We were going to incorporate it. We were going to, we were going to be big time producers. And we were going to do this little commercial with all these colored beacons. And he said, I said, what are we going to call the company? I said, I don't know. He said, I said, well, what should we call it, Lou? I said, well, let's, we're going to do this on film. It's going to be animation. Let's call it Filmation. And that was, it was not a very good name. But after a while, everybody accepted it. For over 25 colorful years, one of Hollywood's most beloved animation production houses was Filmation Studios. From its first Saturday morning success with Superman, Filmation charted a heroic course with musical hits like The Archies, multicultural milestones like Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids, and awesome adventuring with Zorro and the Lone Ranger. Later, with live-action space shows and animated feature films on the docket, Filmation and its crew blazed new territory with the syndicated success of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Through it all, Filmation founder Lou Scheimer guided a talented array of writers, directors, animators, and voice actors. Now, join us to explore the magic of Filmation. I started my animation career at Walt Disney's and from there, I went to Larry Harmon Productions, where I met Lou Scheimer, and we imme immediately bonded. And uh, we had a good time together, a lot of laughs, and we were trying to learn the ins and outs of animation, which we did. And here we were in this big bank building, just the two of us, all these empty desks. The only other resemblance of a human being there was a mannequin model that we put in the entryway, which was our secretarial reception area. We put a wig on her and glasses, and she was facing the door. And that was our receptionist. But it was sort of dark in there, and it, one memorable occasion was somebody did come in and started talking to the mannequin, and they spoke several sentences before they finally realized something was wrong. And by that time, we were out there to greet them personally. Filmation officially began business in 1962, founded by Lou Scheimer, Hal Sutherland, and Norm Prescott. The small group produced animation for commercials, kids' cartoons, and religious films. But finances were tough, until a fateful call led Prescott to a lead at the New York offices of DC Comics. Norm goes back to New York. He had come out from Boston. Norm goes back to New, to New York, and he's sitting there with uh, uh, Silverman, uh, the president of National Periodicals, with a guy named Mort Weisinger, who called himself Superman Weisinger. And Norm calls me. <laughs> From their office now hal and i are sitting there that's hal sutherland who was my other partner sitting there with 24 empty desks five thousand dollars in debt we had a mannequin hand or, or, who was the uh, uh, receptionist uh, receptionist was a it mannequin was <laughs> and and I, I, he said well they, they they'd like us to think about doing it and i said who is us i said that's me and hal and 24 <laughs> empty desks back here he said well uh, uh he said they want to take a look at the studio i said what studio he said, well, he said, we got to do something. I said, he said, by the way, can we do it for $36,000? I said, of course we can do it for $36,000. I had no idea. I have no idea how we could do it for $36,000, but I knew it was better than what we were doing then. So I said, you know what? Have them come down and look at the studio. By calling in animation friends and voice actors to pretend to work at desks, including future Mary Tyler Moore star Ted Knight, Scheimer and Sutherland were able to bluff the National Periodical's representative that their animation studio could pull off the job required to launch the Man of Steel on television. The guy leaves the office, he calls New York, he said they have a little studio but they run a really tight ship. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how they got there. And we got the Superman show to do. One thing on top of another and the studio just kept growing and growing and the employees started to multiply. And along the way, we both learned everything there was about animation, handling, a lot about editing, just by hands-on. Fortunately, we one series after another started to pick up. We got the Archies, which was a grand slam for us. It moved us out into the valley where rent was good. We had a huge two-story building, and this is where we eventually stayed and did most of our production, including He-Man, and moved out there. Things grew and grew, everything but our own salaries. <laughs> Coming into the 70s, Filmation had multiple hit television shows, crossing a wide variety of genres. From musical comedy and series such as Mission Magic, the original Ghostbusters, and Groovy Ghoulies, 
to science fiction and adventure on Space Sentinels and Flash Gordon, to adventure on Zorro and the Lone Ranger, and even to the realm of live action, where Space Academy, Jason of Star Command, Arc 2, and Isis became popular. Prior to He-Man, Filmation had done you know, a wide range of shows in different genres. Some of them had been huge hits, such as Fat Albert and Archies and Groovy Ghoulies, and a lot of them had been based on other uh, properties, such as Star Trek and uh, Gilligan's Island. We did a thing called Gilligan's Planet, where the castaways actually escaped the island, only now they've crashed on a planet, and now they're stuck on a planet. So there was just a wide range of, of genres that Filmation produced prior to He-Man. There were three shows that were really big hits, Archie, Fat Albert, and He-Man. And then we have all those other little shows. Some of them were really great little shows. You know, it was, it was such a small company when Filmation first started, and we knew everybody, and the, the, the Christmas parties and all that stuff were always at our house because we knew everybody. It was very small, and it, and, uh, and one and it day was we turned around great. and were 875 people working yeah. there. We had a, a list of people who worked for the company. There was over 2,000 names on that list in, uh, in the years that we were really in business. The years we were really in business was from 1965 to 88. So it's about 22, 23 years. But in those, in those 23 or 24 years, we trained new animators, we trained new directors, we trained new layout people, we, we made work available for, for voiceover artists, we kept the work in this country. The best thing about working on an animated show is working with the people who are doing it. It really was a pleasure on a daily basis to go in, oh, there are problems all the time, but to go in and see a lot of people working together, doing something worthwhile, happy with it, making a living at it, and doing something that was helpful as far as the audience was concerned. The industry expanded so rapidly when they started doing Saturday morning television. Uh, I was over at Disney's uh, in the late 50s when they started doing Saturday morning programming and all at once. So all those directors at Filmation just automatically went into directing. And then they started pulling up some younger people like myself to fill in. I think my favorite part of working on this series was working with the young animators and bringing them along. We were so busy, we had to bring up a lot of assistant animators who hadn't animated before. And then you got into a lot of coaching, which I really enjoy. It's, it's teaching. And working with them, uh, they, would, they felt free to come back. And if they had problems with a certain kind of action, I could rough it in for them send them back to do it, test it. Um, it was a real learning experience for them and they appreciated it. When I started at Filmation in 1977, it was very much the same as it was when I, I left when they closed, a, a family atmosphere. As soon as I walked in the doors, I was quite anxious. I was very young, only like 22 years old and had never worked in the industry before and I didn't know what to expect and I felt so comfortable with everyone immediately. And the moment I met Lou Scheimer, who's this, this imposing tall man with a, a deep and loud voice, <laughs> even with all of that, I still felt immediately comfortable around him. So the, the feeling at the studio was, um, was very family-like, hardworking, but not um, seriously stressful. Filmation was like you couldn't tell from the outside what it was. I mean, it said Filmation on it, but if you didn't know what Filmation was, you would look at it and figure it was just a small office. I think it was on a corner. I think it was one story tall. There really wasn't much to it on the outside. Once you went in, of course, there were things on the walls. There was all sort of art on the walls from their shows. And that made it a whole lot more interesting. There was a writer's room. I remember Joe Straczynski and Robbie London and Larry Dottilio, and they're just sort of sitting there madly typing away. It was really unusual because you had all of these creative people working in a factory environment. I mean, the bell came, rang at 8.30, you were in your desk, and Arthur, boy, if it was 8.35 and you walked in, well, you know, this is not a country club. But if you came back an hour late from lunch, he didn't care. Um, so we were expected to be there at 8.30, work for two hours until 10.30 when the uh, catering truck came, then we'd all go outside for 15 minutes, come back, work for two more hours, 12.30, we'd go to lunch, come back at 1.30, work until 3.30, the truck would come back. Um, 
and then we come back in and work until 5.30. So you had all of these really, really creative people. I mean, the writers and the artists and really everybody. Uh, there were, you know, a, a few jobs that weren't creative. But you've got all these creative people on a schedule, punching a time card. The process of seeing your work brought to screen in animation, particularly at Filmation, is a very long, slow, tedious process because you can't just put the camera up, shoot a piece, and you come back. Uh, they break it down to the storyboards, uh, then they do tests, and then you see bits and pieces at a time, one shot at a time. It was all done by hand, all hand painted. So you would see a second or two here and there per day. And over time, you get a sense of it, but you don't see the final um, episode as a whole story until months down the road. And then it's great because you see the whole thing put together. Filmation was the proverbial cartoon factory. And I say that in the fondest sense of the word. It was probably the last place in Los Angeles where, certainly on a large scale, cartoons were made from first word on the page to last frame of film, all in the building. And so there were all different departments spread all over the two floors. And one of the things I loved as a writer was being able to follow my script from department to department and learn. I, I just craved to learn everything I could about that. And that wasn't true of all the writers. In fact, I felt like I was sneaking off playing hooky when Arthur wasn't looking to go to the other departments so I could learn. One of the things I liked about it was that there were the, art, the artists and the animators were right there in the building. So you could uh, you can go and talk to them about it and say, why don't we do this? I mean, we can play with this a little bit or something. It made it a lot easier to get, um, there was communication between the artists and the writers a lot, which in a lot of cases there aren't, a lot of shows there aren't. And since most all of them are done overseas now, very little communication at all. It was a nice group of people and, and uh, there were artists from all these other studios, these wonderful old artists like Jack Ozark and Lou Zucker, who used to work at Fleischer's at the original Popeyes and the original Betty Boops. And uh, we had artists that had worked for Disney's and artists that had worked at, at uh, on the original Looney Tunes and all. And um, it, it, it was fascinating to just kind of swap stories with them, sort of like old soldiers around a campfire. On staff, there were quite a few animators. I would have to say at least 25 or 30 animators. Um, and for the assistant wing, it had to be double that or triple that. I, I really don't know. At that time, I wasn't that con conscious of, of the numbers. But there, there was an army of people working on that series. I think Lou was very conscientious of keeping as much production in the country as he could. This was a time that saw uh, the beginning of a lot of uh, producers and studios sending most of the animation overseas, whether it was to uh, Korea or Taiwan or Japan or wherever. And Lou looked upon that as a disservice to, uh, to U.S. animators. Unfortunately, animation is very expensive and very time consuming. And when you've got like four or five shows, which you'd normally have on, on Saturday morning running at once, your staff is stretched to the limit. So he devised a stock system where they would use the same animation over and over again, where you'd have good animators come in and you draw a hero doing something or a villain doing something or an animal behaving a certain way. And a lot of that was referenced and reused and traced over time and time again. We had piles and piles of stock books showing how characters moved or reacted or setups or, or something like that. Actually, it would happen during the off season while they were preparing for a show to get started. Before they could call back all the animators, the scripts are being written, characters are being designed, uh, and so they would keep some of their key animators uh, employed, creating stock walk and run cycles, dialogue poses and things like that, things they knew they would use over and over and over again, and they could justify keeping those people on the payroll. Then uh, it was anticipated that a certain amount, certain percentage of all the animation would be uh, reusable stock animation, and, and then a certain amount would be newly created for that episode. The guys who, who, created, anim uh, who created Filmation and who, uh, who did these shows, they were, they were uh, making it up as they went along. They were creating a new form of animation. Uh, it's funny because it led to the great animation that was done on, on Batman, the animated series. The, the, we're sort of in a golden age of animation now for television. And so the animation in the 70s and 80s was very limited comparatively. But that was the training ground for all those writers who would go on 
to do the great work on that shows as Batman, um, I don't think you would have had that talent pool if not for Filmation, if not for them being willing to trust writers who had no credits. They would just hire guys and say, okay, let's, let's see what you can do. Filmation was such a unique place to work because it truly, I mean, everybody says that, oh, it was a family, it was a family, but it really, really was. It was because of Lou Scheimer. He was so approachable and so accessible, and you'd see him, he didn't just hide in his office. You'd see him wandering around and looking and seeing, and oh, what are you doing over here? And oh, let me see that storyboard. And he was really, I don't know that he knew everybody's name, but I would say that he knew the name of 90% of the people who worked in that studio. Of the bosses I've had, Lou Scheimer was just a prince. He was just really the best boss. And he just treated you like you were a member of his own family when you worked at Filmation. We had a reunion recently, and everybody turned up that was alive, really. And in most of it was because we all wanted to see Lou again. The guy looked as good today in his 70s as he did then, and he's not pretentious. He's going to tell you he made some money, and he made a lot of kids happy. And that was basically his goal, if he could make everyone happy uh, and turn out a, a good show. You know, that was what he wanted. Filmmaking is an extraordinarily collaborative process. And if you have somebody uh, who has a great influence on you or who is a good person, you just love your job. And that's what I think of Lou Scheimer. Lou is, he was a people person. He cared mostly about his people. He loved his product too, of course, but he cared very much about how his people felt who were working on this product. Lou Scheimer is a genius, a humanitarian, a character, and the best friend one could possibly have. And he is so beloved by everybody that's ever known him. He's just, he's a remarkably unique man and I'm so fortunate to have him in my life. Lou is a very nice guy. It can't be said enough that Lou really cared about American animators. That he, you know, for a long, long time, he was the last guy holding out from going overseas. He wanted to employ Americans. I mean, you could consider him a great patriot just for that. One of the best things that came out of working at Filmation was getting to work for and know Lou. And I mean that sincerely. He's one of the great people in animation to work for. He wanted really good stuff, and he was, he was always willing to let you do it. He wouldn't necessarily be saying, you gotta do this better, but if you gave it to him, he wanted it. I always found him to be a fair guy. He's the guy that put it all on the line. He kept work in the country when everything was pointing, don't do it. And he actually put it on the line and said, I'm gonna keep it here. I'm gonna fight that battle. That's what we're going to do. So I can't say enough for Lou as far as like the integrity of him. He loved the medium, he loved animation, he loved comic strips, he loved everything we did. Lou really wanted to do, make good entertainment for children. He's a wonderful, wonderful human being. I have never on this face of this earth yet in my life meet anybody like him. And he was totally loved by everybody. I wish I could be more like him. He was an egalitarian and, and a, a gentleman and, uh, and a visionary because he, he saw that in the 60s the opportunity for a, a, an entrepreneur, an artist, to uh, take himself by his bootstraps uh, with a little bit of showmanship, a little bit of uh, elbow grease, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of hoopla could, uh, could make himself a, a, a minor Walt Disney. And, and Walt Disney took 30 or 40 years, Lou did it in 10. Lou Scheimer was um, a really nifty guy to work for. He was open to ideas. Uh, he wasn't grandiose about anything. Uh, if you needed him down the trenches, he was there. Well, Lou Scheimer was a wonderful character, uh, still is. Uh, he was, he was, uh, when I first met him, of course, he was the father of one of my students, and so, and I was his daughter's professor, so we kind of circled each other warily, but we got along famously. It was my impression 
that he gave his writers and, and he gave Arthur and Idell just full freedom to do what they wanted to do. He certainly gave it to me. He said, look, I want this to be a show that's good for kids. I want it to be a pro-social show. Arthur Nadell, Arthur Nadell was the single most important person who worked on He-Man. He was a gifted writer, a gifted human being, and had never worked in children's programming before he, I, I, I hired him to do some live action for us. And he got more satisfaction out of people calling and writing and, t and talking about the shows and how those shows had affected their children's lives and, 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 and their own lives. He was very, very serious about this whole thing. Very, um, very uh, down to earth about it. And we have to do this show this way and this episode has to mean this, and that has to be this moral message at the end and everything. In today's story, Skeletor was looking for a shortcut, a quick way to riches and power. You may know some people like that, always looking for the quick way to get ahead of everybody else. Arthur Nadell was a lovely, lovely man. Um, he he um, ha had this wonderful ability to balance the creativity of his writers and, the, and his concern with story and his concern with characterization and drama and the, the realities of producing a program and what it costs and how many characters you could have in a show and, and how many times you could rewrite a scene. I assisted Arthur with his production schedules and Arthur, I'm sure other people have told you what character he was. And Arthur was always, well, we must get organized. We must know what we're doing and what we've got. And these are the scripts that are in premises. And these are the first drafts we have on hand. And then these are the second drafts. And then these are the scripts that we're going to deliver this week to a week. And I go, OK, Arthur, so like, you know, here's the choices on your second drafts. What do you want to deliver this week? Well, I think we'll take this premise that we just gave to Bob forward and we'll deliver it this week. And I'm like, but Arthur, he has, you know, he's written fade in. He looked, he was the spitting image of like the 70 year old Groucho Marx, as I, as I imagine you've heard. So in that sense, he already had my affections because Groucho Marx is one of my heroes. Arthur was a very special person in Hollywood. He had a, a dignity about him that everybody that you ask and remembers, they, I think they all remember his dignity, his uh, conscientiousness, his integrity. And uh, it was kind of like the uh, sort of uh, stern taskmaster a little bit, you know, but the kind that at the end of the movie you love because he's made you do your best work and he was fair and honest and kind and really intelligent. You cannot downplay his commitment to the He-Man show and the fact that Arthur started more people on their animation career than I think any man in Hollywood ever did. Arthur was always willing to give you a shot even if you had no credits. The guy had the biggest heart, you know, in the world and knew everybody in town. About a year after Filmation closed, Arthur Nadell passed away. And at his funeral, there was, it was standing room only, there were people there who had written one script for him. And they felt compelled to show up because Arthur had meant so much for them, had started them in their careers. I can't even begin to tell you how many people that Arthur gave a chance to as writers and who went on to do wonderful things. Hal Sutherland and I started working together in 1957. We've known each other what, for 48 years now. We were working, uh, I was working at uh, Larry Harmon studio. We were doing Bozo the Clown. <laughs> Hal was great too. I enjoyed working with him. He was a, he loved artwork. He was a great artist, a very good artist. And so he was especially enamored with the, with the artwork in the show. Very easy to get along with. I enjoyed working with Hal. Uh, he had good ideas when we were cutting shows. Hal Sutherland was really, really special to me for a lot of, a lot of things. Not only was, you know, he, close partner of my dad. Um, he specifically really introduced me to some of the 
art behind animation. He, I was interested in directing and he worked with me one summer when I was working at Filmation. He worked with me specifically on, on how to direct animation. And he listened to what the artists had to say and he worked with them in a way that I, that I found very special. Hal was a real engine. He was always turning out lots of notes on, on, on uh, the show's fixes and all. One time, uh, Hal was supposed to go on vacation and he, f and he was going to Montana or something and I had just handed him a show. And what Hal did was that he actually telephoned in his fixes from a phone booth in an airport. So, you know, you got this phone call and you're like, hello, uh, drop scene 63, flop panel seven, page seven, restage the uh, uh, opening setup of the castle. You know, huh? <laughs> Hal Sutherland, uh, uh, there's a sort of a natural enmity in animation between artists and writers because writers write things expecting the artists to execute them and we make it hard on them. And I, I, I don't know, I bonded with Hal very early on. And so when Hal came back, he had a, a warmth about him and an eagerness to share. And I learned really a lot from him about the animation process that really informed my scripts. And we're still friends to this day. Filmation would eventually become the last all-American animation studio, a fact that was not lost on a grateful industry. By the time it closed its doors in 1988, Filmation's creators had produced thousands of hours of animation won awards, earned gold records, and taught valuable lessons to children in over 30 countries. Most of the talented men and women who worked at Filmation remained in the entertainment field, becoming award-winning writers and directors. Now, with the public's excitement and nostalgia for Filmation projects high, the creators reflect on a magical time. I think a lot of uh, really interesting talent came out around that time. Filmation was an amazing uh, training ground for uh, writers and, and artists, and uh, it was it was always it was, the studio was always willing to open its doors to new talent and uh, give people a shot. And that from then it was kind of up to you as to what you did with it. You know, you could go on and, and do other things in animation, or you could, you know, uh, stay at one level, or else just get out of the business. But um, it was it was a good place to uh, for, uh, for for beginning talent. And a lot of people started there, and a lot of uh, people uh, went on to other things. I'll say one thing. Uh, when I speak to people who worked at Filmation today, they said we never realized how good we really had it then, because it truly was a family. I mean, we were working under tight schedules, tight budgets. Everybody there was professional. I mean, um, uh, maybe not me, but uh, the others certainly were. I mean, there was animation artists there who uh, were classic animation artists who were certainly working under tight budget restraints, but they were so good at what they were doing, they gave the show a style. There was one particular instance, I think, in the last few years, but three years ago, somebody got the idea, let's have a reunion of the Filmation employees. I thought that was great. I flew in from Washington, other people came distances from Nevada and other places, but there were about 250 people showed up. It was awesome. And they were just thrilled to be a part of Filmation. And they all had something good to reminisce on. Many of the people I met at Filmation are still my friends today, including Joe Gall. Uh, uh, who was a supervising editor. He and I have remained fast friends and we are still at Warner Brothers together editing. And uh, that f those friendships are, are one of the greatest uh, rewards of working at Filmation. One of the great, great things about working on He-Man was, was, were all the friends that you made who have lasted a lifetime and people that I'm still in contact with and many of whom I still work with professionally. I, I currently I'm an executive at Deke, which is another big animation company, and I'm still working with a lot of the same people. Don Roberts, uh, who was our consultant at Stanford at the time, uh, is still consulting for us at Deke. Uh, we've used a lot of the same writers, Phil Harnage, Bob Forward, and Pam Vincent, who was Arthur's uh, secretary. Now we call them assistants at the time, they were called secretaries. And she went on to work at Deke, where I currently work. It's, it's sort of a, uh, a lifetime of continuity with Pam and uh, many, many other people who have stayed in my life and who come back in my life. It was, it was a magic time with a wonderful group of people and, and lifelong bonds, really. Out of the Filmation Storyboard crew, 
most, everybody in that crew has become a director, a producer, if not a writer. Some of them have gone to really big things. I ended up running Marvel Studios for years. Tom Cito directed feature films. R Richard Ahrens was Spielberg's right-hand man at Warner Brothers and Tiny Toons. And Vicki Jensen directed Shrek. You know, that doesn't happen by accident. When I was a young man, watching uh, television, a little boy even, watching the shows that Filmation produced, Lou was one of my great inspirations. And uh, Lou and his company and the, the guys who are my friends now uh, gave me a break. And I'm just so thrilled that, that he and I have had the kind of association that we've had. Uh, it, it's been a blessing, and, and, uh, and I, every time I talk to him, I, I'm thrilled. An interesting thing about working at Filmation, in every business, you always hear about the family aspect. We're all family. Filmation is truthfully the closest I've ever been to that. It genuinely was a family. And it would have to come out of loose sincerity for one. Animation is poorer these days for there not being a filmation and uh, somebody like a Lou Scheimer running it. It's the reality of the business, but the dividends that came out of that have benefited fans and the industry immensely. Arthur was very, very much against using guns, and at one time an edict came down that uh, said, you know, when you're using weapons, make sure that they don't look like a gun. You can have a ray device, you can shoot, a, you know, a ray or a beam or whatever, but it's not a gun. And I believe it was Bob Forward who took the line from the script, which was, uh, you know, angle on the, whatever the character's name was, holding a weapon that does not look like a gun. And Bob's got him holding a pineapple. It was hysterical. I remember like just down the block from our studio, um, uh, at a little, uh, little local bank, I used to bring my paycheck and it had Filmation printed on the check. And I would pass it to the teller with my deposit slip. It was before ATMs. And, um, and the uh, teller would say to me, that name, Filmation, I keep seeing that on checks. What is that? And I said, oh, you know, that's the animation company down the block, you know, you know. And, and, and uh, he goes, what do you do? I said, well, we do He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. And she goes, all right, He-Man rules. And I'm like, uh, could you have somebody else check the math? <laughs>